All right, so in this video, we are going to be reviewing everything that you need to know about cognitive development across the lifespan of an individual. So if that's something that you are interested in, then go get the guided notes for this video by clicking the link in the description below and follow along as we start off our review. Now, when talking about cognitive development, we are talking about how an individual's skills and thinking changes over time. One psychologist that we need to talk about when it comes to cognitive development is Jean Piaget, who studied how children learn and think about the world. Piaget believed that children developed schemas Remember, a schema is a mental framework that is used to understand and organize information about the world. For example, my one-year-old son has a schema for dogs. For him, it includes anything furry that has four legs and a tail. Now for you, I would bet that your schema for dogs is more refined. If you notice, my son's schema is pretty vague. In fact, he will often call other four-legged furry animals dogs as well. As people get older, they continue to learn, resulting in their schemas becoming more detailed and accurate. Piaget believed that schemas develop through continuous and discontinuous processes, such as assimilation and accommodation. Remember, continuous development suggests that development is a gradual and ongoing process, with changes happening little by little over time, while discontinuous development suggests that development happens in stages, with big changes occurring at specific points in life. Now, I mentioned assimilation and accommodation, and we need to make sure that you understand the difference between these two concepts. Assimilation occurs when an individual experiences new information and puts that information into an existing schema. For instance, let's go back to our dog schema. Say you come across a new breed of dog that you have not seen before, such as a Tibetan Massifus. I mean, seriously, look at that dog. Those dogs are intense. Definitely wouldn't want to get on their bad side. Now, odds are you can still understand that this unfamiliar breed of animal is still a dog, so you will Will probably add it to your dog's schema. This is an example of assimilation because the new information is being put into an existing schema. Okay, so let's go back to my one-year-old son, whose dog schema is pretty general and vague. As he gets older, he will continue to grow and learn, resulting in him having to refine and adjust his schemas. This process is known as accommodation. For example, sometimes when my son right now sees a cat, he will call it a dog, since both cats and dogs have four legs, a tail, and fur. But but as he starts to get older, he'll start to realize that cats meow and dogs bark, and he'll have to adjust his schema. We can see that as he continues to grow and develop, he will form a schema for cats and for dogs. So we can see that the process of accommodation happens when something doesn't fit into the original schema, causing you as an individual to change your schema. At the end of the day, just remember, assimilation adds new information to a schema and does not alter it, while accommodation adds new information to a schema but does alter it. Now, Piaget believed that cognitive development occurred in four main stages, which would be an example of discontinuous development. The first stage is the sensory motor stage, which generally starts at birth and goes until the child is around two years old. During this stage, children gain access to their hands and begin to move, with learning occurring through the child seeing, touching, hearing, and through their actions. For instance, grabbing, pushing, or throwing items. One of the major cognitive developments that occurs during during this stage is the development of object permanence, which is the understanding that objects continue to exist even when they're out of sight. Children during this stage are constantly exploring their environment and learning through their physical interactions and sensory experiences. During this stage, the child's ability to manipulate objects is the key to them understanding the world. Now, the next stage generally starts when the child is around two years old and goes until the child is around six or seven years old. This is known as the pre-operational stage. Toddlers and children in this stage start to develop symbolic thinking. They learn to use language and will engage in pretend play. Symbolic thinking refers to a person's ability to think about things that aren't right in front of them. This often complements pretend play, which is when a child uses their imagination to act out different scenarios with toys, objects, and other children. For instance, my three-year-old daughter right now has a super active imagination and is constantly acting out different scenarios and asking lots and lots of questions about different aspects of life. Children often will also show animism during this stage. This is when human-like qualities are given to non-living things. For instance, during pretend play, children might say that certain toys have feelings, thoughts, or other human characteristics. And then, because 
but I gave her a lot of food. That's and good. now she really liked it. She really And now it. she wants more food. Well, why don't you give her some more food? I can't because we don't eat in her bed. Because why does it eat in her bed? Yesterday I gave her a little bit and then she was really sad yesterday. Now she couldn't finish it. But then she got so hungry at night yesterday. Now while children do become better at using mental symbols, they still will struggle with concepts such as conservation and reversibility. Conservation is the idea that something stays the same amount even if its shape changes. For example, pouring water from one glass to another. Reversibility on the other hand involves being able to mentally reverse an action. For instance, a child may understand that two plus two equals four, but struggle to understand that if you subtract two from four, it still equals two. Children also during this stage are egocentric, meaning that the child tends to have difficulty seeing the world from another person's point of view. To see if children were egocentric, Piaget had children complete his three mountains task. This task involved a child looking at a model of three mountains. After studying the mountains, a doll would be placed down in the model. The child would then be asked to pick out a picture that would best show the doll's perspective. If the child picked out the picture that showed their own perspective, it was most likely that the child child was still egocentric, since they picked the picture that showed what they saw instead of what the doll would see. As children get older, they do start to develop a theory of the mind. This generally occurs towards the second half of this stage. This is the ability for a child to understand that other people have thoughts, feelings, and perspectives that are different from their own. Now, when a child is around age six or seven, they start to move into the next stage, which is the concrete operational stage. Children in this stage become more logical and can perform for more mental operation. For instance, during this stage, children can grasp concepts such as classification and seriation. Classification is when an individual can organize objects based on multiple attributes, such as sorting objects by color and shape simultaneously. While seriation is when an individual can arrange items in quantitative order, such as arranging sticks from order from shortest to longest. Now, while children in this stage will be able to start thinking logically, they still will struggle with systematic systematic and abstract thinking. Hypothetical scenarios or reasoning about possibilities will be hard for the child to grasp and truly understand. So we can see that during this stage, children can fix many of the cognitive errors they used to make in the pre-operational stage, such as conservation and reversibility. Now eventually an individual enters the last stage, which is the formal operational stage. Generally this starts when an individual is around 11 or 12 years old. One thing that was interesting with this stage is that Piaget believed that not everyone will reach this stage, or at least not fully achieve everything in the stage. During this stage, people gain the ability to think abstractly, use logic in more advanced ways, consider hypothetical situations, and ponder philosophical questions. Individuals in the formal operational stage can also approach problems methodically and logically, even when the situation is abstract, oftentimes utilizing deductive reasoning, which involves starting with a general principle and applying it to specific situations. Situations. Now these stages are important, so to recap, remember that the sensory motor stage is defined by learning through experiences and a person's senses. The big event here is the development of object permanence. The pre-operational stage is where mental symbols are used. Pretend play occurs, egocentrism, animism, and the start of the theory of mind all happen during this stage. Next is the concrete operational stage, which is again when a person thinks logically about real things, develops the ability to understand conservation, and reversibility and becomes less egocentric. And lastly, the formal operational stage is all about thinking abstractly, logically, and processing hypothetical situations and philosophical questions. If you do need more help with Piaget's stages, then make sure to check out the practice quiz inside my ultimate review packet. Each question focuses on different concepts that you need to know about the different stages. Plus, I added explanations for each answer so you can see exactly why the answer is right or why it's wrong. Now, it isn't just Piaget that you want to be familiar with when it comes to cognitive development. We also need to talk about Vygotsky. 
who believe that learning doesn't just happen inside an individual's head. It also happens through the different social interactions that an individual has and through the environment that the individual is part of. Vygotsky came up with a theory that is referred to as the sociocultural theory. This theory believes that children develop skills and knowledge by interacting with people around them. The theory focuses on the importance of social interaction, guidance, and support in cognitive development. The two main concepts of this theory are are the zone of proximal development and scaffolding. To explain this, let me show you a visual. At the center of this circle is the child. Everything in this starting circle, the child can learn on their own. These concepts are easily within the individual's mental grasp. However, if we move out to the next circle, we can see that the child will start to struggle. These concepts are outside of the child's ability, meaning if they were trying to learn these concepts on their own, they would most likely fail. But, and this is the key part, if the child has support and is given help from another individual, for instance, a teacher or a parent, the child will be able to learn the skills or knowledge. The second circle is known as the zone of proximal development. It is the sweet spot between what a child can do on their own and what they cannot yet do. If we move out to the third circle, we get to concepts and skills that the child child is not ready for, and even with the child getting support, they won't be able to learn the concept and master it. Now one important note that I want to highlight here is to best help the individual learner, the teacher or other individual should not just give the learner the answer. Instead, they should use scaffolding. Think of scaffolding like training wheels. The adult or person who understands the concept only provides enough information to help the child or learner get to the next step. They don't just give the individual the answer. Instead, they provide support and guidance to allow the individual to reach the answer on their own. This theory is why schools often have students participate in group discussions, work with peer tutors, or engage in one-on-one -on -one discussions. The goal here is to provide opportunities for learning to occur through social interactions. Now, if you need more help with Vygotsky, his theory, understanding the ZPD or scaffolding, then make sure to check out the practice quiz I created on Vygotsky's theory inside my ultimate review packet. You can click the link down below and start reviewing today. Remember, you need to be active in your learning, not passive. Now, as individuals grow older, their ability to think starts to change. We can see that some of our mental skills stay the same. Some get better, but some also start to decline. Over time, as an individual enters adulthood and they age, they see their crystallized intelligence grow. Generally, this stays stable over time and even improves as you get older. This is because you keep adding new information to it. Remember, crystallized intelligence is the information you've already learned. Learned. These are facts, vocabulary, and general knowledge. But while an individual's crystallized intelligence continues to remain stable, your fluid intelligence often declines. Generally, a person's fluid intelligence peaks in their early adulthood. As individuals age, they start to see that it takes more time to learn new information, solve puzzles, and adapt to different situations. This is because an individual's fluid intelligence, which remember is an individual's ability to reason quickly and think flexibly, starts to decline, which would explain why when I play Fortnite now, the editing and building looks like witchcraft. So we can see that as individuals age, they often start to rely more on their crystallized intelligence and less on their fluid intelligence. Now, unfortunately, when an individual ages, their cognitive capabilities can be impacted by different cognitive disorders. One that you want to make sure that you are familiar with is dementia, which is a broad term for cognitive disorders that significantly impair memory, reasoning, and other mental abilities. Dementia isn't a single disease. Instead, it references a variety of symptoms that are caused by different conditions, the most common being Alzheimer's disease disorder. All right, that's it. That's all the time we have for today. Don't forget to go take the practice quizzes inside my ultimate review packet to make sure you're truly understanding all of this information. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time online.